Paul, a divinely summoned and divinely appointed ambassador belonging to Christ Jesus, an ambassador by reason of God's determining will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the assembly of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been set apart for the worship and service of God. This act of setting apart having been accomplished by being placed in Christ Jesus, and thus being in vital union with Him, consecrated ones, this consecration having been by divine appointment and summons, with all those who are calling upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I am thanking my God always concerning you, the cause of my thanksgiving being the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. I mean that in everything you were made rich in Him, this wealth being in the form of every exuberant aptitude in proclaiming the word and in the form of every kind of experiential knowledge. Inasmuch as the testimony concerning the Christ was proved to be divinely revealed truth, and its reality was verified among you with the result that you are not feeling that you are trailing behind others in even one spiritual enablement for service while you are assiduously and patiently waiting for the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also will make you steadfast and constant even to the end, in character such that you cannot be called to account in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is God, through whom you were divinely summoned into a joint participation with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I beg of you, please, brethren, my appeal to you being enforced by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that name holding within its compass all that he is in his glorious person and wonderful salvation, I beg of you, please, that all of you be speaking the same thing, and that there be no factions among you, but that the breaches in your fellowship caused by these factions having been healed. You may remain perfectly united in the sphere of the same mind and in the sphere of the same opinion. For it was made clear to me concerning you, my brethren, by members of Chloe's household, that there are wranglings among you. Now, what I mean is this, that each one of you is saying, As for myself, I am a follower of Paul. But as for myself, I'm a follower of Apollos. But as for myself, I'm a follower of Kephas. But as for myself, I'm a follower of Christ. The Christ has been divided into various parts with respect. The Christ has been divided into various parts with the present result that he lies there broken up into fragments which are distributed among you. Paul was not crucified on your behalf, was he? Or... It was not into the name of Paul that you were baptized, was it? I'm thankful that not even one of you did I baptize, except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone say that into my name you were baptized. However, I also did baptize the household of Stephanus. Besides, I don't know positively whether I baptized any other person, for Christ did not send me on a mission to be a baptizer, but to be a bringer of good news not bringing this good news within the realm of philosophical discourse, lest the cross of the Christ be emptied of its true significance and power. For the story, that story concerning the cross, is on the one hand, to those who are perishing, foolishness, but to us, on the other hand, who are being saved, it is God's power. For it has been written, and is at present on record, I will destroy the wisdom of those who are wise, and the discernment of those who have the ability to discern I will frustrate. Where is a philosopher, skilled in letters, cultivated, learned? Where is a man learned in the sacred scriptures? Where is a learned sophist of this age, fallacious, reasoner that he is? Did not God prove foolish the wisdom of this world system? For, in view of the fact that, in the wisdom of God, the world system through its wisdom did not come to have an experiential knowledge of God. God saw fit through the aforementioned foolishness of the previously alluded to proclamation to save those who believe. For both Jews are constantly demanding and attesting miracle 
and Greeks are constantly searching for wisdom. But as for us, we are proclaiming a Christ, one who has been crucified, to Jews on the one hand an offense, to Greeks on the other hand folly, but to those themselves who have been divinely summoned into salvation, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, God's power and wisdom, and God's wisdom, because that aforementioned folly of God is wiser than men, and that aforementioned weakness of God is stronger than men. For, take a good look at your divine summons into salvation, brethren, that not many wise men according to human standards, not many men of dignity and power, not many who are of royal or aristocratic lineage are given that divine summons into salvation. But God selected out for himself those individuals among the world of sinners characterized by the aforementioned foolishness in order that he might put to confusion those who are wise and those individuals among the world of sinners characterized by weakness God selected out for himself in order that he might put to confusion those who are characterized by strength and those individuals among the world of sinners who are not of royal or noble ancestry but belong to the common people and those who are utterly despised. God selected out for himself. The aforementioned classes of individuals looked upon as non-entities in order that he might deprive of force, influence, and power those who think themselves to be some, somewhat. To the end that humanity may not in a single instance boast in his presence. But as for you, out from him as a source are you in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom for us from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that even as it stands written, he who boasts in the Lord let him be boasting. And as for myself, having come to you, brethren, I came, not having my message dominated by a transcendent rhetorical display or by philosophical sublity, sublity when I was announcing to you the testimony of God. For, after weighing the issues, I decided not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and this very one as crucified. And as for myself, when I faced you, I fell into a state of weakness and fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not couched in specious words of philosophy, but were dependent for their efficacy upon a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, in order that your faith should not be resting in human philosophy but in God's power. There is a wisdom, however, which we are in the habit of speaking among those who are spiritually mature, but not a wisdom of this present age, or even a wisdom of the rulers of this age who are in the process of being liquidated. But we speak God's wisdom in the form of a mystery long hidden, but now revealed and understandable. That wisdom which has been kept secret, which God foreordained before the ages with a view to our glory. Which wisdom not one of the rulers of this age has known in an experiential way. For had they known it, in that case, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But even as it stands written, the things which I did not see nor ear hear, and which did not arise within an individual's heart, so many things as God prepared for those who love him. For to us God the Father revealed them through the intermediate agency of his Spirit. For the Spirit is constantly exploring all things, even the deeper things of God. For who is there of men who knows the things of the individual person except the human spirit of that aforementioned, aforementioned individual person which is in him? In the same manner also the things of God no one has known except the Spirit of God. But as for us, not the spirit of the world system did we receive, but the spirit who is of God, 
in order that we might come to know the things which by God have been in grace bestowed upon us, which things also we put into words, not in words taught by human philosophy, but in words taught by the Spirit, fitly joining together Spirit-revealed truths with Spirit-taught words. But the unregenerated man of the highest intellectual attainments does not grant access to the things of the Spirit of God. For to him they are folly, and he is not able to come to know them because they are investigated in a spiritual realm. But the spiritual man investigates indeed all things, but he himself is not being probed by anyone. For who has come to know experientially the Lord's mind? He who will instruct him. But as for us, Christ's mind we have. As for myself, I also, brethren, was not able to speak to you as I would to those dominated by the Holy Spirit, but as I would to those dominated by the evil nature, as I would to, the, as I would to those in Christ who are still immature spiritually. Milk I fed you, not solid food, for not yet were you able to assimilate the latter. In fact, not even yet at the present time are you able to do so. For, in so far as there are among you jealousy and strife, are you not those dominated by the evil nature? And are you not ordering your manner of life as an unsaved man would do? For whenever someone says, As for myself, I indeed am a follower of Paul. But another of a different character says, as for myself, I am a follower of Apollos. Are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? We are ministering servants through whose intermediate agency you believed. Servants, in each case, in the manner as the Lord gave to each of us. As for myself, I planted, Apollos watered, but God has been causing that which was sown to grow so that he who plants is not anything, nor he who waters, but God who causes things to grow. Now, the one who plants and the one who waters are one, but each one of us will receive his specific pay appropriate to his specific work, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's land under cultivation, God's edifice, according to the grace of God which was given to me. I, as a skillful master builder, laid a foundation, but another builds upon it. But let each one be taking heed how he builds upon it, for an alternative foundation no one is able to lay alongside of the one which is being laid, which foundation is a person, Jesus Christ. Now, Assuming that anyone builds upon the aforementioned foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, the work of each person will become apparent, for the day will make it known, because it, the day, will be made clear as to its identity by means of one of its attributes, namely, fire. And the fire itself will put each person's work to the test for the purpose of approving it, should it meet the required specifications. The test being to, deter to determine what sort of work it is as to quality. Assuming that the work of anyone which he has built upon it, the foundation, Christ, endures in that it has met the, these specifications, he shall receive a reward. Assuming that the work of anyone will be burned up, he will incur a loss. But he himself shall be saved. But being saved thus, it will be as escaping destruction in the midst of the fire which burns up his works. Do you not all know that all of you are God's inner sanctuary and that the Spirit of God is making his home in you? If, as is the case, Anyone morally corrupts the inner sanctuary of God. This person God will bring to the place of ruin. For the inner sanctuary of God is holy, of which holy character you are. 
Let no one continuing to be deceiving himself. If, as is the case, anyone among you thinks himself to be wise in the sphere of the things of this age, let him become a fool in the estimation of this age, in order that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world system is foolishness as God looks at it. For it has been written and is at present on record he catches those who are wise in their false wisdom. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of those who are wise, that they are futile reasonings. Wherefore, let no one continue to be boasting in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Kephas or the existing order of material things or life or death or present things or things about to come all belong to you and as for you you belong to the Christ and Christ belongs to God in this manner let a man measure and classify us as servants of Christ and as those who have been entrusted with the mysteries of God and their disposition under these circumstances, it is further sought in stewards that a man be found to be faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I am being put on trial by you, by the judicial day of mankind. In fact, I do not even put myself on trial, for I am, a co for I am conscious of not even one thing against myself. But not by this means do I stand justified. Indeed, he who puts me on trial is the Lord. Wherefore, stop exercising censorious judgment with reference to anything before the apocal strategic season, until that time, whenever the Lord may come, who will both turn the light on the hidden things of the darkness and bring out into the open the counsels of the hearts. And then to each one there shall come his praise from God. And these things, brethren, I referred to myself and Apollos, things true of the world class of servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, to which we belong, doing this for your sakes, in order that you may learn from our example not to go beyond the things that stand written, to the end that you do not, do, that you do not bear yourselves loftily, one on behalf of one individual, teacher, as against another of a different character, for who makes a distinction between you and others? And what do you have which you did not receive? But since also you received it, why are you boasting as though you did not receive it? Already have you become completely sati satiate satiated with the result that your state of complete satisfaction persists through present time? Already did you become wealthy? Without us did you enter that new state of being in which you reign as kings? However, I wish indeed that you did reign as kings, in order that, as for us also, we might reign as kings with you. For it seems to me that God exhibited us, the apostles, as those who, in the eye of, eyes of men, are the most inferior in the scale of human existence, as men doomed to die because we were exhibited as a spectacle to be gazed at and made sport of by the universe, both by angels and men. As for us, fools are we on account of Christ. But as for you, you are members of the intelligentsia in your union with Christ. As for us, we are those who are frail and infirm. But as for all of you, you are those who are mighty. As for all of you, you are those who are illustrious, honorable, held in esteem by others. But as for us, we are those whom no one respects. To this very hour we are hungry and thirsty and scantily clothed and maltreated and, going from place to place, we have no fixed home and we labor to the point of exhaustion, working at our trade, that of tent making, with our own hands. When insulting abuse is being heaped upon us, we invoke blessings upon those who are mistreating us. When we are being persecuted, we patiently bear it. When we are publicly slandered, we pleadingly admonish, I beg of you, please. 
We have become in the estimation of the world as the filth, discarded by humanity as the result of cleansing oneself. Dirt scraped off of all things to this very moment. Not as shaming you am I writing these things, but as my children, beloved ones, I am warning and admonishing you, for if you may be having ten thousand tutors in Christ, yet not many fathers do you have. For in Christ Jesus, through the gospel, as for myself, I begot you. I beg of you, please, therefore, be becoming imitators of me. For this very reason I sent to you Timothy, who is my child, a beloved one, and one in the Lord, who is trustworthy and can be depended upon, who will bring to you bring to your remembrance my ways which are in Christ Jesus even as in every assembly where everywhere i am teaching now on the supposition that i am not coming to you certain ones having an inflated ego but i will come to you shortly if the lord wills and i will take cognizance not of the speech of those with an inflated ego but of their power for the kingdom of God is not in the sphere of speech, but in that of power. What are you desiring? With a stick shall I come to you, or in a love that has its impelling motive, the benefit of the one loved? The exercise of which love demands self-sacrifice, and in the sphere and in the spirit of meekness. There is actually fornication reported to me among you, and this fornication of such a nature that it does not exist even among the Gentiles, that a certain person is possessing the wife of his father. And as for you, you have been guilty of an inflated ego and are at present in the same state. And ought you not to have rather gone into mourning to the end that the... to the end that the one who has done this deed might be taken out of your midst? For, as for myself, I indeed, being absent in the body but present in the spirit, already handed down my sentence, and this sentence stands as though I were present concerning this one whom thus did this thing. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, my sentence is that you deliver such a one to Satan for the subjugation of the flesh, the evil nature, in order that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting in the state of the local assembly is not seemly or fitting. Do you not know with a positive assurance that a little yeast permeates and affects the entire bread dough with itself? Cleanse out completely at once and once for all, the old yeast, which is part of a world which has passed away for you and out from which you were saved, in order that you may be a fresh aggregation of individuals, even as you are without yeast. For, indeed, our Passover was slain, Christ. Wherefore, let us be keeping the feast, not with the yeast which has been regu relegated, to a time that is past when we live the life not for us today, neither with the yeast of malice or perniciousness, but with the cakes permeated and affected by the yeast of an unadulterated life, having no admixture of evil in them, and having in them the yeast of truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to be mingling in a close and habitual intimacy with those who indulge in unlawful sexual intercourse. I did not altogether forbid you having dealings with the fornicators who are members of this world system of evil, or with those who are covetous and rapacious, or with idolaters, since then you would be obligated to go out of the world of mankind. But now I am writing to you to urge you not to be mingling in a close and habitual intimacy. Should anyone who is called a brother Christian be a fornicator or a covetous person or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or, or rapacious with such a person not even to be eating? 
For what responsibility of mine is it to pass judgment upon those who are outside the church? Indeed, those who are outside will God judge. Expel at once the pernicious person from among yourselves. Is any, is, is any one of you who has a case against another daring to be going to law before those who are unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not all know that the saints shall judge the world system of evil? And in view of the fact that the world system is being judged by you, are you those who are unfit to sit on the tribunal of a judge where trifling affairs are judged, forming courts yourselves to settle matters ab among yourselves? Do you not know that we shall sit in judgment upon angels to say nothing at all of judging the affairs of this life? Therefore, if you may be having courts for the adjudication of your private matters, those who are least esteemed and of the most humble station in the local assembly, seat these on the judge's bench. I am saying this to you with a view to arousing your sense of shame. Is it thus that you do not have one among you who is wise, who will be able to arbitrate between brother and brother? But brother goes to law with brother, and this before unbelievers? Nay, it is already a total moral defeat for you, having lawsuits with one another. Why do you not permit yourselves rather to be wronged? Why do you not permit yourselves rather to be defrauded? But, as for yourselves, you are committing wrong, and you are defrauding, and doing this to brethren. Or do you not know that unrighteous individuals will not inherit God's kingdom? Stop being deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adul adulterers, nor those who are of a voluptuous nature, given to the gratification of sensual, immoral appetites, neither men who are guilty of sexual intercourse with members of their own sex, nor thieves, nor those who are always greedy to have more than they possess, nor drunkard, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit God's kingdom. And these things you were, certain ones of you, but you bathed yourselves, yourselves clean from sin in the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. But you were set apart for God, but you were made righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All good things are under my power of choice to be doing, but all things are not profitable. All things are under my power of choice but I will not be brought under the power of any one of them. The various kinds of food are for the stomach, and the stomach is for these various kinds of foods. But God will abolish both it and them. But the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. And God raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up through His power, did you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Having taken then the members of Christ, shall I make them members of a harlot? Let not such a thing take place. Or, do you not know that he who joins himself with his harlot is one body with her? For they shall become, he says, these two, one flesh. But he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Be fleeing from fornication. Every act of sin which a man may do is outside of his body, but he who commits fornication is sinning against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is an inner sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were purchased at a price. Now, therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, with reference to the things concerning which you wrote, it is perfectly proper, honorable, morally befitting for a man to live in strict celibacy. But because of these, but because of the fornications, let each man be having his own wife, and let each woman be having her own husband. Let the husband be rendering to his wife that which is due her, and also let the wife render to the husband that which is due him. 
The wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. Likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not continue to rob each other by withholding yourselves from one another, except it be by mutual consent for a time, in order that you may give yourselves to prayer, and that you may be united again, in order that Satan may not solicit you to sin because of your lack of self-control. But this I am saying by way of a concession in view of your circumstances, not by way of an injunction. But I wish that all men were even as also I myself. But each one has his own spiritual gift from God, one on the one hand in one way and the other on the other hand in another way. I say then to the unmarried man and to the widows that it is a right procedure for them if they remain as I also am. But assuming that they are not able to exercise self-control in the realm of a continent life, let them marry, for it is more advantageous to marry than to continue to burn with the heat of a sexual passion. But to those who have married I command, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not depart from her husband. But If she depart, let her also remain unmarried, or let her be reconciled to her husband. And the husband, let him not be putting away his wife. And to the rest, I myself speak, not the Lord. Assuming that a certain brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she herself is content to to live with him, let him not be putting her away. And the wife who is such that she has an unbelieving husband, and this husband is content to live with her, Let her not be putting her husband away, for the husband who is an unbeliever has been sanctified by virtue of his association with his wife in her position as a saved individual, this sanctification being in the marriage relation, that marriage being declared holy by reason of the Christian standing of the wife. And the unbelieving wife has been sanctified by virtue of her association with her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Just a reminder, that part is Paul's opinion, not God's opinion. But assuming that the unbelieving husband departs, let him be departing. A Christian brother or Christian sister is not in the position of a slave, namely bound to the unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife in an indissoluble union in case such as these but God has called us to live in peace for how do you know positively O wife whether you will save your husband or how do you know husband whether you will save your wife only as the Lord has assigned to each one his lot in life as God has called each one in that way letting him be ordering his manner of life And so, in all the assemblies I am giving orders, 